Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, hello. If you are returning, welcome back. Thank you so much for sticking around. I really appreciate you. So today's video has been a long time coming and I think it's because I was struggling to find the angle that I wanted to go with it or like the route that I wanted to go with it. But today we're gonna be talking about like the history. It's a history lesson on fat activism, body positivity, etc., etc. For context, this was going to be called the body positivity history lesson, but we're gonna get into that in a little bit. Today, we're mainly gonna be living in like the 60s and the 70s, and that's because I feel like that's where a lot of the really important origins lie with this whole movement. Um, even though we all know it's like alive and well today and like a lot has happened today to advance it and to progress it. I just really wanted to focus on the 60s and the 70s because I feel like those are the two most important decades when it comes to the birth of fat activism, body positivity, whatever you want to call it. I know we just did an another history lesson a couple days ago. That's not what I really intended to do, but that's kind of just how the cookie crumbled this month. <laughs> um, but I do think that the history lesson I did, which was the history, like a diet culture history, History lesson in the 20th century and this one tied really well together because especially with talking about the 60s and 70s I feel like diet culture and the birth of fat activism were like hand in hand like went hand in hand and so if you haven't went and watched that video please go watch it shameless self promo I'm really proud of how it turned out <laughs> so yeah I'll have that linked wherever first before we do anything this is my 150th video wild weird never expected to be here we're like less than 3,000 subscribers away from 70,000 which is almost putting like 100k like as a goal a realistic goal for like this year insane uh thanks everybody <laughs> and honestly what a fitting topic for my 150th video but before we get into today's video you want to know what we need to talk about we need to talk about underwear and bras <laughs> Specifically your underwear and bras, and also specifically what underwear and bras I have been wearing a lot of recently, because this video is sponsored by Parade. I am so excited to be working with Parade because I have been wanting to try Parade for a very long time. If you don't know what Parade is, they are a bra, underwear, intimate lingerie company, and they also sell things like apparel and bodysuits and stuff like that, and they put a big focus on sustainability and size inclusivity. And the first thing that always stood out to me about Parade when I started seeing their ads is the size inclusivity. Like they go up to a size 5XL and I got all of my stuff in primarily a 3X and I'm like a 16, 18 and just clothes. But I will say, I think I could have gone down a size on a lot of stuff, but it still works. We'll get to that later. They go up to a size 5X and they have a lot of size diversity on their website and in their models and all of that, which I think is great. And a lot of it is very like gender neutral, which I think underwear should be. <laughs> they sent me a ton of products to try out and to show so I could really get a good idea of what I liked. And the first thing I wanna show you is this bralette that I'm wearing right now. This is the support lift plunge bralette and this thing is so soft and comfortable. This one I did get in a 3X per my measurements um, because I actually measured myself like correctly this time and uh, I am a 42G. I do think I could have stand, stood to size down a little bit but honestly I don't really care because this thing's really comfortable and it does what it needs to do for me. <laughs> the next recommendation that I have from all the products they sent me are any of the triangle bralettes. I got it in a few different colorways. I got quite a few pairs of underwear from Parade also. The favorite one that I have, I actually don't have with me um, because it's in the wash because I wore it, um, but it is the Sheer Sculpt Pop High Rise Cheeky panty underwear situation. I was also, I want to mention this because I was really hesitant about trying the mesh underwear because I was afraid that it wasn't going to have um, cotton like in the gusset for breathability and like comfort. And that's, that's really important to me. Um, but I am pleased to report 
that all of the underwear I received, no matter what, all has cotton in the gusset and that is super important to me. So Parade has been kind enough to gift my viewers a coupon code for 40% off site-wide excluding sale because those discounts are already discounted. <laughs> uh, but so use the link in my description box below and use the code HEYLOOK40 for 40% off site-wide on your purchase. That is H-E-Y-L-O-O-K for zero, uh, hey look 40, for 40% off your purchase. And so thank you so much to Parade for sponsoring today's video. And thank you so much to you guys for continuing to interact with my content so that brands like Parade wanna work with me. I was so excited for this one and I hope you are too. And if you do decide to get anything, let me know down below because I am nosy and everybody deserves comfy underwear. So yeah, all right, let's get back into the video. So I wanted to make this video because honestly, after covering so much like modern day fat activism, I wanted to figure out how we got where we are and like how it actually started. Because even like with the fat activist creators themselves, we see so many different stories. We see so many conflicting stories. We're told that it was created by fat black queer women, which I really don't think it was. Um, and so I just wanted to like sit down and like dive into like how this started. And I do wanna give a shout out to Nadia Nymph because her video was really a great starting off point for me to kind of get some names to dive into and see what was happening. But yeah, this was, uh, uh, I, I just wanted to figure it out. I just wanted to see how we got here. Again, in my diet culture history lesson video, I talked a lot about the evolution of different um, body trends throughout time and as well as how like what was ideal or desirable for particularly women's bodies changed a lot like even dating back to the early 1900s and in my weird role of feminist or fat activist feminism video, I touched on the fact of how I understand like why and how this movement was seen as necessary and like even still is seen as necessary today sometimes. But I always thought they had just strayed like so far from what it started out as and that, that they started to work against themselves and that it was really sad to see a movement that started for people loving their bodies no matter what and not being treated differently because of their bodies morphed into what fat activism is now. But like, boy was I mistaken because I think myself and a lot of other creators, specifically in my like realm of the internet, we all had this idea, at least when I used to part like consume a lot of content like I make now, which I don't really anymore because I make it. I think a lot of us, myself included, thought that fat activism had morphed from like body positivity and uh, that and that body positivity started as a way for people with like truly marginalized bodies like burn survivors, amputees, people with disabilities, et cetera, et cetera, for it to like find a community. At least that's what I thought for a really long time. And when I was actively taking in more of this kind of content, that was a message that I saw a lot. So I don't know where everybody stands on it now, but that's just from past experiences. Imagine my surprise when I started researching, because like I said, this was gonna be a body positivity history lesson. When I started researching this, I could not find a single article, like tweet, uh, study thesis anything on the origins of body positivity and i looked up like every iteration that i could find i was like body positivity origins with people with disabilities body positive like i looked up every iteration that i could think of and nothing came up if anything i really only found think pieces from burn survivors and amputees and stuff like critiquing the body positivity movement and like why it doesn't have more to do with them than it does and why it only has to do with fat people. All that came up in terms of like actual origin stories were that of the original fat activism movement. And so like, correct me if I'm wrong and if I just missed something, but I really think that body positivity started as fat activism. And this was just so shocking to me because like when I started, for those of you that don't know, 
the whole reason I have a platform is because I made a video about my experiences within the fat activist community or the fat act, uh, the fat acceptance community as like a young 16 and 17 year old and how that I feel really negatively impacted my life as an impressionable teenager. The, the reason I got into it at all is because I thought it was just a place on social media for people who had maybe not typical, quote unquote, typical bodies um, to go and like celebrate themselves because like that's just not what I was seeing in media, in magazines, and anything. And it was just really cool to see like other fat girls like living their lives and being happy. That's why I was like so sucked into it. But it wasn't, at least when I was in it, I really didn't see just like fat people or at least like super fat people and so it was always under this guise or umbrella of body positivity and then it kind of morphed into like the harmful fat activist rhetoric that we see today and so i was just really shocked to find out that it was like always fat activism it wasn't ever just like anybody could be part of the body it was always just fat activism but i do think now a lot of the body positivity creators online anyway like it's a lot of like love your body no matter what and you see a lot of different kinds of people with different kinds of bodies aside from just fat people and this is why i think a lot more fat activists today which is something i've been noticing are going back to using terms like fat activism fat liberation body liberation fat positivity that kind of stuff because i think they feel like body positivity has been hijacked by the thins and so i was just surprised when i like came across that and i just wanted to say like if anybody's watched a video where i'm like hey body positivity started this way and then it turned into fat activism uh i was wrong <laughs> so yeah unless anybody can correct me in the comments like i really think i was just mistaken and so i wanted to start that this video with that because i think it's important and so let's get into like the actual origins now and i do want to say that like the majority of all of this is coming from um, directly from NAFA or the National Association for the Advancement of Fat Acceptance's website um, and like offshoots of that from various social media platforms. And contrary to what fat activists on TikTok want to say, no, uh, fat activism was not founded by fat black queer women. It was actually founded by two very white, as far as I know, straight men. These men were Bill Fabry and Lou Lauderbeck. Bill Fabry was an engineer who was fed up by the way his wife was being treated because she was fat in society. And then he read a piece in the Saturday Evening Post by a journalist called named Lou Lauderbeck called More People Should Be Fat. It was all about how Lou and his wife, who were both fat, had become, quote, refugees from the insanity of dieting. Bill said that after he found this article, he was like so, he found it to be so profound that he like made copies of it and started giving it to everybody he knew. And, but he felt like he wanted to do more than that. And after that, with Lou's help, the two teamed up and they wound up through, after so much, creating the National Association to Aid Fat Americans, which today is now known as the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance. And Bill Fabry was named the first board chair, and Fabry and Lauterbach also went on to research and write a book together called Fat Power. And at face value, that all sounds super, like, cool, whatever. Like, two guys who, like, were sick of seeing how their wives were treated, and in Lou's case, sick of seeing how he was treated, and, like, they just wanted to do something about it. Because, like I say time and time again, like, I've been over 300 pounds, and I've been under 200 pounds, and I've seen and experienced the differences in how I was treated in both of those different sizes and like it exists and i think it's something to talk about um especially within the medical system and i get that where they're coming from with all of that but where it gets hinky for me is when you actually hear bill favory talk about like the start of it if you're not new to my channel it's no secret that the way that fat activists today conflate their oppression with like black communities and queer communities and disabled communities like really grinds my gears because it's it's always just like painfully obvious that they do so to gain some kind of brownie points and to add some sort of credibility to their otherwise like weak arguments 
And even when they say they're a feminist movement kind of irks me, but we're going to talk about that later and why I now kind of understand more of where that sentiment comes from. And you can hear more about my view on the feminism side of things in the video that I made about it, which I'll have linked here. But I thought these comparisons came more to be like in modern day fat activism um, and not in like the origins. Like I thought the origins were more so about like medical stuff because that's what's talked about a lot when it comes to talking about fat activism in the 60s. But no, no, no. In a NAFA interview from three years ago, Bill Fabry almost uses the other social justice movements that were happening at the time as like a way to build legitimacy around the fat activism movement as well. Well, first, let me talk a little bit about the time the time and, uh, and place of all this. Uh, this was the 1960s we're talking about. Um, I, I looked up a few dates. In 1963, Martin Luther King wrote his letter from the Birmingham, Birmingham jail. All right, that was 63. That was six years before we started. Um, in 1967, that, was, uh, that year was uh, the issue of the Saturday Evening Post that author Lou Lauterbach wrote his famous article called More People Should Be Fat. That was really revolutionary because he was not saying that people should try to be fat. He was trying to say there are fat people and they're making their lives miserable if they're all on diets because they're food deprived and they're irritable and, and they're judgmental about other fat people. He went on and on to say this. Uh, and that article gave me a lot of inspiration. But let me, it's 1969 was June 13th was our first meeting. Um, two weeks later was the Stonewall uprising in New York City in which gay rights got a jump start. Um, a lot of people don't, I, I've encountered gays who don't know what Stonewall was. And, uh, you know, it's where a bunch of gay men and, and also uh, lesbians came in. Everybody got involved in confronting the New York City police who raided, had raided the Stonewall Tavern and made the usual arrests and so forth. Uh, and it was at that, at that event, which lasted several days, that finally the mayor told the police, lay off the gays. We got more serious things to do. And... Um, so they, they got a jump start, and that was only two weeks after our first meeting. And he then turns around and says that he felt like he was in the closet with his attraction to fat women, like ever since he was a kid. I got inspiration for NAFA from all of these groups. Um, I'm not gay myself, but I totally relate to them because I, have, I, as a man who has always admired the larger figure in a woman, I always felt the same, similar pressures on me that that I realized that you know, gays must encounter when they're growing up. And I'll get into that a little bit later because part of my, my motivation and my anger was that, you know, how dare anybody tell me what I should find attractive. I think a lot of people who, who have only seen photos of you online and have only seen your headshot online, who know you through your writing and through hearing your stories or hearing you in interviews, do not realize that the person who started the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance has is not and has never been a fat guy. Yeah, I was a lot skinnier then too. Um, no, at, at this point, after, for the last 30 years, I've been technically defined as, and please pardon the word, obese by the U.S. government. I'm just on their borderline. So I'm officially fat, by the way. But that, 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 that's neither here nor there. I was thin at the time. Uh, in the course of being attracted to the larger ladies, um, and I had lots of friends of all sizes, um, I developed, developed a lot of anger about, about it, about the fact that you know, that I had to be in the closet about it, that I had, you know, couldn't, my, my, one of my best friends, I had invited a, a slightly chubby girl to the prom. He said, who are you taking to the prom? I said, so-and-so, gave the name. He said, well, why would you go on when I go out with that pig? That's when he became my ex-friend. Which drawing that comparison while also talking about things like the civil rights movement and Martin Luther, Martin Luther King, and especially when you're talking about being in the closet, Stonewall is so bold and just so out of touch. And I am queer, so like, I do have a bias here, but like, because you're not going to get disowned from your family for liking fat women. You're not going to have your personal safety threatened while walking on the sidewalk for dating a fat woman. And like, is being critical of two consenting adults preferences or relationships nice or a good thing to be at all? No, because it's none of your business, but it's not the same thing as being like in the closet, especially especially back in the 60s and 70s. And then when you go find the key points from Lou Lauterbeck's article, the one that says everybody should be fat, you get things like 
quote, it has now become so in to be thin and that and fat people's civil rights are repeatedly and openly violated. Keep in mind, this is in the 60s. Uh, fat people are discriminated against in jobs and in education. And three, uh, sexual responsiveness in women is positively and significantly correlated with a general positive attitude towards food and eating. I'm sorry, what? Like, I didn't go to school for psychology or any of that. I went to art school, but like, what? Following the formation of NAFA, they started working on annual conferences. And so this was like a way for fat people to like meet and celebrate and find community and a lot of times find romance. And one thing I noticed is that a lot of what fat activism is rooted in, especially from back in the 60s, it's it's a lot of, it seemingly had a lot to do with attraction and romance and dating. And I'll put some clips here from like these conventions. Um, that, that becomes a huge factor in how NAFA develops over the years. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we even found ourselves starting a dating service within NAFA just because there was a vacuum. There were no dating. There were kind of just to start of computer dating, but none of them provided for the fact that you might be fat or you might be looking to date a fat person. So we started one and some marriages resulted and, and we ran that for several years. And I think at various points throughout NAFA's history, including now that there are people who have very mixed feelings about that. Sure. Yeah. Um, we, were, we were very happy when other organizations filled in the gap as far as dating is concerned. You have fat night clubs, you have other, you know, some of the some of the computer dating services have expanded to provide for being fat. Although match.com is horrible, as they say. The, the only category you can check is um, have a few pounds to lose. If you're fat, you can check that box. Have a few pounds to lose. Yeah, no. But, <laughs> no. Yeah. but look around this room, she said, and you can't deny there are many attractive women here. This model bride was attractive enough to catch the fancy of the man who stands beside her. They were married a year ago. I'm happy with my husband and I'm happy with my life. I'm me. It doesn't matter whether I weigh 150 pounds or 350 pounds. And I'm you weigh 350? Mm-hmm. 375. 375, he'll brag. <laughs> <laughs> but during the weekend we spent with them, many of the young women at the convention spoke candidly about the difficulties, the obstacles they'd encountered in finding male companions. Men would like to be with fat women in the open, go to restaurants and everything else. But society has put so much pressure on them, telling them, hey, you have to go out to a restaurant with a skinny woman. That's right. You can't be seen with a um, fat woman. Many men seem to have a fantasy of going to bed with a fat woman. They enjoy it. And once they get there, believe me, they enjoy it. <laughs> but met some of them don't want to be seen in public with us. They're not going to take us up. A lot of the guys are in the closet about liking fat women. They come here, they're single guys. They don't want their friends to know they're with fat women. It's very hard when people ridicule the type of women that you like and say they're ugly. And they laugh at you when you walk with them arm in arm down the street. Some people like to look at fat people. I love to look at a fat woman on the beach. If I saw Marilyn Monroe or Gina Lollobrigida on the beach, they turn me off. It's just like looking at a board. And it seems like a lot of the men at these conventions went to meet fat women, which to me seems like a fat thing but um and, and it makes me wonder if that's why it seems that when i'm looking at things on tiktok and stuff today why so many people who are using the fat liberation fat activism hashtags and stuff are so obsessed with like desirability and dating and being found attractive by other people i don't know but it was just a thought that like I had. NAFA would continue to do its thing. It still exists today. But one thing that I had absolutely no idea about before researching this video, and I've been told since that other people in this realm of the internet have talked about this, I just haven't seen it, is this group of women in California in the 1970s called the Fat Underground. They were doing their own fat activism work and they actually coined the term fat liberation. That's where that term came from. They felt it was more accurate to what they were trying to do. And the Fat Underground was more was seen as like the more radical and activism minded chapter of NAFA. Um, but I think they received some like backlash for being too 
like harsh and so they wound up being they wound up separating from NAFA later but it should be mentioned that a lot a lot of the women in this group were one radical feminists at the time and lesbians also just judging by the amount of research that I have done for on this group and for this video I really think this group is where a lot of the like main fat activism talking points that we see today come from and we'll talk about that because their idea was to reform society and not themselves and they used the rhetoric doctors are quote doctors are the enemy weight loss is side so yeah but in 1979 uh or it was 1973 1979 or 1973 i couldn't get a like couldn't get an exact date um two members of the fat underground named jody free spirit and sarah aldebaran i'm sorry if i butchered that um published their fat liberation manifesto and this was in response to Susie orbach's book um, fat is a feminist issue. Susie Orbach is a British psychologist um, who published this book in 1979 and it's considered to be like a pioneering anti-diet book. And from a summary that I found, it sounds like Orbach's book focused on a complex thesis, which was that gender inequality makes women fat. And in the book, Orbach writes, quote, for many women, compulsive eating and being fat have become one way to avoid being marketed or seen as the ideal woman. In other words, what your fat says about you is screw you. Fat expresses a rebellion against the powerlessness of the woman. And she also goes on to say that some women become fat to, quote, be taken more seriously in their working lives outside of the home, which like as a side note, if I'm understanding this correctly, I feel like this point goes against what Lou Lauderbeck had covered in his art in his original article about how um, fat people aren't hired as often or are fired more often, but I don't know. She also states that women become fat to desexualize themselves or to avoid competition with other women or because of their own mother's relationship with food, which is I think is relatable. But Orbach wrote this book based on like her own experiences with quote, like 10 years of binging, dieting and self-hatred. And then she took a course on compulsive eating and apparently that changed the whole outlook on her life for herself. And then she went to offer therapy, she like started offering therapy for women with EDs and one of which was Princess Diana. I had never heard of this person before and I was like, all right. And honestly, this book sounds kind of interesting and I think I want to listen to it now because I am an audiobook girly, but it sounds interesting. So I think I might give it a chance. But in response to this book, the Fat Underground published their Fat Manifesto and this featured two reviews of Susie Orbach's book. And then it featured a little blurb that was talking about taking action against like, um, a poster that was supposedly oppressive to fat women at the time. And then at the end, the fat manifesto was written out. And so I'm gonna read that here, just so you can get an idea. It says, fat liberation manifesto. One, we believe that fat people are fully entitled to human respect and recognition. Two, we are angry at mistreatment by commercial and sexist interests. These have exploited our bodies as objects of ridicule, thereby creating an immensely profitable market selling the false promise of avoidance of or relief from the, that ridicule. We see our three. We see our struggle as allied with the struggles of other opposed oppressed groups against classism, racism, sexism, ageism, capitalism, imperialism, and the like. Four. We demand equal rights for fat people in all aspects of life. As promised in the Constitution of the United States, we demand equal access to goods and services in the public domain and an end to discrimination against us in the areas of employment, education, public facilities, and health services. Five, we single out our as our special enemies the so-called, quote, reducing industries. These include diet clubs, reducing salons, fat farms, diet doctors, diet books, diet foods, and food supplements 
treatments, surgical procedures, appetite suppressants, drugs, and gadgetry such as wraps and, quote, reducing machines. We demand that they take responsibility for their false claims, acknowledge that their products are harmful to the public health, and publish long-term studies providing any statistical efficacy of their products. We make this demand knowing that over 99% of all weight loss programs when evaluated over a five-year period fail utterly and also knowing the extreme proven harmfulness of reported large changes in weight. Six, we repudiate the mystified science which falsely claims that we are unfit. It has both caused and upheld discrimination against us in collusion with the financial interests of insurance companies, the fashion and garment industries, reducing industries, the food and drug establishments. 7. We refuse to be subjected to the interests of our enemies. We fully intend to reclaim power over our bodies and lives. We commit ourselves to, the, to pursue these goals together. Fat people of the world unite. You have nothing to lose. And so that's the fat that's the fat liberation manifesto. And I found this video um f called History of the Fat Underground from 1979. And in this video it's a group of women all part of the fat underground talking about their different experiences being fat and the different discriminations that discrimination that they've experienced. Um, some tell stories about how they've been mistreated by doctors and how that affected them. And some tell stories of uh, their SA and how they weren't taken seriously when coming forward about it. And which, judging by how those things are even still approached today, like I can only imagine that it was probably way worse back in the 70s. And so... I like empathize with that part of it fully. Um. A lot of what we do in the Fat Underground is informational because it's real important that we know that we're not crazy and that information has been suppressed. But one of the most important parts of the Fat Underground is sharing our pain with each other and sharing what's happened to us, the stories that nobody ever hears because we're too embarrassed and because we think we're too crazy, we're the only ones until we find out that there are millions of us out there. A lot of my pain has to do with doctors. When I was 14, um, we were on a camping trip and I got a pain in my side. And I kept that pain in my side for two days without telling anybody much about it. And finally, I, I had to go to bed. My mother made me go to bed and I said, you know, Ma, it's nothing to worry about. Don't worry. I don't want to go to the doctor. And I refused to go to the doctor for like two and a half days. And finally, I had to be taken to the hospital. My mother physically dragged me out of the, out of the house to go to the hospital because it turned out that I had a ruptured appendix that had turned gangrenous because I'd waited so long. And the reason that I waited so long was because the last time I had been to the doctor, he had put me on a diet, and I hadn't lost any weight. And I knew that what I had was serious. I could feel it in my body, but it felt a lot more serious to go to that doctor not having lost weight than to go in the hospital with a gangrenous appendix because there wasn't a whole lot to live for anyway. Um, years later, I started having back problems. I had these terrible, terrible attacks, my pain in my back. And so I went to a doctor who um, charged me $15 and didn't examine me and sat there across from me and said, well, you know, as long as you're fat, you've got to expect things like that to happen. And I said to him, um, I'd like maybe a little more coherent explanation of what's happening to my body. And he said, well, you know, fat women, what happens to you? You're going to have to expect pain there, and you're going to have a lot more things coming. And I, I went through that with a couple of doctors. Of course, it turned out later that I had a congenital malformation in my back and my bone structure that I inherited from my mother. But then I spent like um, two years going from doctor to doctor and um, trying to lose weight and it not helping when I lost weight and thinking that I was crazy and um, being real hurt when they wouldn't even want to examine me because they didn't want to look at my body. Um, one thing I thought was interesting is that they do touch on the decrease in food quality uh, and that's something I feel is something that we don't hear a lot from fat activists today and I think is actually a very valid point with the rising obesity rates in the country is like our food kind of sucks at least in America and so I think it's something to point out. Today's markets are filled with foods that are not foods. 
Produce and processed foods are loaded with antibiotics, preservatives, dyes, and flavorings. These mask the basic lack of flavor resulting from inferior nutritional value. And they also single out diet culture a lot in this video. We single out as our special enemy the so-called reducing industries. These include reducing salons, diet clubs, diet doctors, diet books, diet foods, and appetite suppressants. We demand that they take responsibility for their false claims, acknowledge that their products are harmful to the public health, and publish long-term studies proving any statistical efficacy of their product. We make this demand knowing that over 99% of all weight loss programs when evaluated over a five-year period fail utterly. Why are their advertisements pitched almost entirely to women? But what was like super fascinating to me while watching this is, and maybe it shouldn't have been, but like was how they were saying so many of the same things that fat activists say today. The most important piece of medical information for me was a study that's been very widely duplicated. And that's a study, on a long-term study on how many people lose weight and gain it back. 99% of the people who lose weight gain it back. Ninety percent of those people gain back more than they lost. Researchers imply that being fat is a cause of certain things, but that's not what their studies show. Take high blood pressure, for example. Their studies show simply that there is a correlation between obesity and high blood pressure, but they leave out that there is also a correlation between being black and having high blood pressure. Probably between being any oppressed minority in this country and having, having high, high blood, blood pressure. pressure. The real causative factor is stress. I'm Debron, and um, I think I was real crazy because I would see that I didn't eat very much and that in fact the things that were called fattening like pastries and fried potatoes and all that, I didn't eat hardly at all. And yet I was always fat. And so obviously I was just wrong about my perception of things. And I guess that that gets down to one of the paradoxes that we have in the fat underground where in order to get our point across and make people believe us when we say that the medical profession is lying when they paint us all as gluttons, we have to quote medical research that we've um, looked up in medical journals. I don't want to be separate from you anymore. Too long I've had to be separate. Too long I felt out of place. I've worked for you, I've worked for your causes, I've worked until I'm tired, bone tired, and I get nothing back from you. Nothing. I want it to change. I want you to get a hold of yourself from the inside out and change. And I want you, when you see a fat woman on the street, I want you to think of me. And I want you to know that that woman may be smiling, but underneath that she has not much to smile about. And I want you to give her the same respect you give me. I demand respect. And I demand it for all my sisters. I demand it when you see a fat woman on the beach. And you can't bear to look at her thighs. I demand that you turn around and you look at her thighs. And then the same as yours. I demand that when you see a fat woman in a bus and you start thinking about how much room she's taking up and how hard it's going to be to get by her, that you know damn well that that woman probably hasn't gone out in a week because she's scared to get on a bus, because she's scared of people like you. It's important to remember that the body needs to maintain a stasis. The body wants to remain at a certain level. And when you disrupt your body chemistry, by gaining and losing weight creates tremendous pressures on every organ of your body, particularly on things like the heart, which is a muscle. And one of the things you lose every time you lose weight is muscle tissue, so that your, your heart will be deteriorating after a while, but for example, what probably happened to Cass Elliot.
Someone they reference a lot in this video is Cass Elliot. And Cass Elliot was an American singer and a member of the group, The Mamas and the Papas. And after The Mamas and the Papas broke up, she went on to release five solo albums herself. I love Cass Elliot and I think she had such a beautiful voice. But the thing about Cass Elliot was that she was a fat woman in the 70s. And because of this, she did yo-yo diet a lot with some of her methods going as far as starvation. And like I discussed in my diet, his in my diet culture history lesson, um, Anna was big during the 60s and 70s. And this was mainly a lot thanks due to um, like the mod fashion trends that came out of this time. Fashion models also being super thin, like we got Twiggy from England and all of that. And so I think with the beauty standard changing to that, it made women both in the public eye and not feel like they had to attain this to be desirable. It's a tale as old as time. <laughs> I have no doubt that Cass's yo-yo dieting and her being so much in the public eye like went hand in hand together and the pressure that she must have felt. But unfortunately, when she was 33, Cass died of a quote, fatty myocardial degeneration due to obesity, AKA a heart attack that was brought on by fatty degeneration of the heart muscle fiber. Um, she was dieting at the time of her death, allegedly, and this is a point that the fat underground stuck to a lot. Doubly, unfortunately, and I believe this fully, that this was due to her size, um, a rumor spread that Cass died from choking on a ham sandwich, and this was especially um, due to the first, allegedly, due to the first doctor who examined her after her death kind of starting this rumor and then doing nothing to dispel it. The doctor's last name was Greenberg and I found an article kind of explaining it from his point of view and he said, and it said, Greenberg immediately offered a straightforward explanation for Cass's death. His first impression, he told the press, was that it appeared to have been a simple case of asphyxia. From what I saw, when I got to the flat, he told the Daily Express, she appeared to have been eating a ham sandwich and drinking a Coca-Cola while laying down. A very dangerous thing to, get, thing to do. This would be especially dangerous for someone like Cass who was overweight and who might be prone to having a heart attack. She seemed to have choked on a ham sandwich, he continued. And he like never gave, like he never let up on this statement. But once the final like examinations were done, it was found that she died of a heart attack. So with that rumor element, like I can totally understand like why the fat underground would bring Cass into their cause for sure. But I think the fact of them uh, ignoring her real cause of death is like irres was irresponsible and is something that we still see today with fat activism um with fat activists whenever someone in the community unfortunately passes away like it's never the fat's fault it's always like the fat phobia and the diet culture's fault because that was a big thing that the fat underground touched on a lot when it came to Cass was that she was dieting at the time she passed away at the end of the video there's a section with the title with a title title called what is the relationship of Cass Elliot's death to your life and it goes on to play her song young girls lament which is like a beautiful haunting song go listen to it if you haven't um but then it lists like a bunch of different and like sometimes horrible things that specifically women have had to go through like throughout history including things like forced sterilization and SA and foot binding, as well as like less serious things like like corn and life being a beauty contest, all that kind of stuff. Which like some of these things that are listed, I could see being correlated to cast, like specifically the beauty pageant or the beauty contest element of things. And I'm not sure if she was a survivor of SA either, but like some of the things they use seem irrelevant to Cass as a whole. And it seemed weird to bring her into it. Now, I feel like I kind of saved the best for last with this section. And again, if anybody has talked about this, I'm not trying to pretend to be brand new here, but it was just my first time hearing of this at all. And this is the fact that the fat underground and the radical therapy movement of the 70s worked very closely together. And this is why I think a lot of the mentality surrounding fat activism that we see today um, is coming from the fat underground 
part of things in the history of fat activism. Part of me also wonders this because is this why like queer women are brought up so much with the starting of fat activism? Because a lot of the fat underground women were lesbians. And I also think that the fat underground's formation and existence is also how fat activism is linked to feminism because they were very much linked to radical feminism in the 60s. Those are just two thoughts that I had. But the radical therapy movement was really like advanced in the 70s and the 80s. And it's defined by the American Psychological Association as quote, any clinical intervention that focuses on the harmful psychological effects of social problems on individuals and that encourages individuals to help themselves by changing society. And in an article about the fat underground and radical therapy from Williams University, they put it this way and I thought it summed it up really well. It says, quote, according to the rhetoric of the radical therapy movement, people with mental illness were not to host the burden of changing themselves. We are instead supposed to change the stigma surrounding mental health. This, quote, change society, not ourselves ideology was the foundation for much of the activism in the fat liberation movement. And I thought this was fascinating because like I said, one, I'd never heard of it. And two, it explains so much why we hear what we do today in the fat activism community. And I think it's the main reason why so many people take issue with fat activism today is because of the fact that they take little to no responsibility with fact that yes, they are mistreated because they are fat. They are treated differently because they are fat. I will not deny that. But they take little to no responsibility with the fact that they can change that treatment if they if it's bothering them that badly. And I get that it sucks to like feel like you have to fix something about yourself to like fit in really truly. I get it. I'm mentally ill. <laughs> like I understand. But a lot of times we hear them talking about these like radical therapy talking points and it's in the context of like fitting into things like chairs or clothes and I'm personally of the opinion as someone who's been there like when things just in every day-to-day -day life start getting unnecessarily difficult like that should serve as kind of a wake-up call and like something that only you can change but that's just my opinion, but that's not radical therapy's opinion. Anyways, that's kind of it on the fat underground. And I thought this was so interesting because I had never heard of this before. Um, and I think it added a lot of context to like why fat activism is the way that it is now because I don't think a lot because I don't think a lot of what we see today so much is rooted in NAFA as it is fat underground at least on the internet which I know is very different from real life but that's just my experiences and of course a lot more with fat activism happened in the 80s 90s and 2000s like they would protest outside of the white house um, they'd have more fat activism conventions um, and the publishing of health at every size by dr lindo bacon was huge um, but like in my diet culture history lesson sorry to keep going back to that video so much the 2000s could warrant its own video on this topic and i would be very interested in doing like a part two of sorts on that time in this movement because that's the time that I like grew up in and so I think it would be very interesting um, but for now I'm gonna leave it here because I feel like we've already covered so much and have gotten a lot of very important context as to why fat activism is the way that it is now um, but yeah so leave some music emojis like music note emojis or whatever uh, if you made it this far in honor of Cass Elliot because she truly was a light and like a great great talent like I love Cass Elliot and I was excited to be able to talk about her even a little bit today but thank you so much again to Parade for sponsoring today's video be sure to check out the link down below in my description um, and use code HeyLook40 at checkout for 40% off your purchase again that doesn't go towards um, the lightning sale or uh, the Betsy Johnson collaboration 
but it goes towards everything else. Go check that out. That's Hey Look 40 for 40% off your purchase. Um, H-E-Y-L-L-O-K-4-0. And thank you as always to you guys for continuing to watch my content and for making this far, making it this far and making it so that like I could create 150 videos like I had a reason to. I cannot describe how appreciative I am of this and I it's insane that we've made it this far and I'm just excited to be here um but yeah that's all I have for today I'll see you next week remember to be kind to yourself be kind to others drink your water take your meds and I will see you in the next one okay bye